Hi everybody, my name is Jessica Pierce and I'm a bioethicist in the United States affiliated with the Center for Bioethics and Humanities at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus. And I'm gonna talk about ethics and research involving animal subjects. So a little bit of background first. Over the past six decades, a significant revolution in research ethics has taken place. The revolution can be said to have begun with the Nuremberg trials, during which the extent and horrors of medical experimentation carried out by the Nazis on prisoners were made public. It gained momentum after the publication of an influential paper by Henry Beecher published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1966. In that paper, Beecher described 22 medical studies, each one of which had been published in a prestigious medical journal, which was conducted without the knowledge or consent of the participants. Um, the most um, infamous of these, perhaps, is the Tuskegee syphilis study, which tracked syphilis in 412 black men in the American South. Researchers studied the progression of the disease until the men succumbed to death, letting participants go untreated even after pen penicillin was identified as effective in curing the disease. The men were never informed that treatment was available. These revelations led to the formation of the National Commission for the Protection of Research Sub Human Subjects and Research in the United States, which in 1979 published what has become known as the Belmont Report. The Belmont Report articulated a set of basic ethical principles to guide research involving human subjects. First, Belmont articulated a complex principle that philosophers call beneficence, with beneficence referring to the moral obligation to be kind and to do good for others and to avoid causing harm. Belmont underscored the need to actively identify sources of actual or potential harm. It emphasized that selection of research subjects must occur within a broad framework of justice, and that certain groups, for example, should not be expected to bear the burden of research while others obtain the benefits. Particular care was taken to safeguard groups of people vulnerable to exploitation, such as prisoners, young children, and the poor. Belmont also articulated what has become known as the principle of respect for persons. Individuals should never be treated merely as a means to an end. Respect for persons involves treating people as autonomous agents capable of making their own choices. People should voluntarily choose to participate in research and should be given adequate information about risk in situations where the capacity for self-determination is limited, for example, in young children, extra protection is required. Sorry, I have a sunbeam right in the middle of my face here. I'm not sure I can escape from that. Um, with the level of protection increasing as the vulnerability of the research subject increases. Belmont established a clear framework for improving the protection of human subjects in research and began a rigorous and still ongoing debate among ethicists, researchers, policymakers, lawyers, patients, and others about how best to understand and implement the Belmont principles. Belmont was not a static one and done articulation, but the foundation for a living evolving framework for discussion that is as relevant today as it was 60 years ago. The authors of the Belmont Report didn't just invent principles or pull them out of thin air. Um, rather, the moral principles identified by the commission were identified, um, tapped into a common morality and represented um, what they believed were points of consensus among a diverse range of philosophical and theological beliefs. So in other words, the moral norms articulated in Belmont are quite general and represent ideals to which many of us aspire in daily life. 
don't cause harm to others, practice kindness, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, treat people with respect, be fair. These basic principles that guide human actions with each other arguably also for some of us, many of us guide human interactions with other living beings. The Belmont Report offered a framework for what philosophers would describe as the specification of general principles. So reducing um, what is general and indeterminate, um, a general norm like um, do no harm, and giving it increased gui action guiding capacity within specific contexts by looking at specific cases. Um, and in this case, within the context of biomedical re research on, on human participants. Which is to say that although Belmont was written with protection of human subjects in mind, the general principles may have equally good traction as we think about research involving other animals and our interactions with animals more generally. The process of specification within bioethics generally involves a movement back and forth between general norm or principle and a specific case that challenges us to say exactly what we mean by the norm or principle. For example, in the context of human research ethics, the commitment to getting informed consent has been nuanced through discussion of research involving children. Can a parent consent on behalf of their child? At what age or at what stage of emotional development might an adolescent be able to consent for themselves? Similarly, how should we think about consent with people who are incarcerated? Can a prisoner ever give truly informed consent to participation in research or might there be currents of coercion such as fear of reprisals or hope for reward or parole that would cloud decision making and make a choice not autonomous. What I'd like to do is explore um, for the next 25 minutes or so what it might look like to try to specify these general commitments um, within research involving non-human animals. Um, I'm taking research with animals broadly here to include not just laboratory-based medical studies, um, but a broader range of scientific investigation that actively includes animals in knowledge acquisition. And I'm going to further narrow my focus to dogs, um, partly because this is my area of expertise and partly because I think it's useful to focus on one species at a time when we're trying to specify um, specify the principles into um, action guiding um, action action guiding um, principles. Also, I think dogs are an interesting focal point because of their close affiliative relationship with us, because many dogs share home environments and live as quasi family members. So I'm going to run through a series of cases involving dogs in research, which invite us to think through uh, specification of the Belmont principles. And, you know, this is really just a scratching of the surface, um, you know, this specification of norms in human medicine, as I said, has been ongoing for 60 years or more, and it's still as active, if not more active than ever. So this is just, it, it's a conversation that hasn't really gotten um, robust within the animal realm, but um, there's a lot of room for it to, to become that. So first I'm going to present a couple of cases that ask us to specify the concept of harm. What counts as a harm? Um, how much harm is too much? And how do we weigh harms against potential benefits? Uh, included in this uh, is a uh, further specification of the question whether dogs are a vulnerable population um, and what might make them vulnerable. After that, I'll talk about two cases that can push on the, the issue of fairness in subject selection. And finally, I'll present a case that asks us to think about respect for persons and particularly about consent and voluntariness. And I thought I would be upfront from the beginning um, about where I stand, which is, you know, to my thinking, a great deal of the research conducted on dogs 
and even some of the research conducted with dogs um, violates the core principles articulated in Belmont. And a lot of research violates these principles in obvious and even egregious ways. And I'm not gonna focus on these obvious, obviously problematic um, research examples because I think more fruitful conversation can occur um, in relation to cases that are really ambiguous and where it isn't clear whether the research violates any moral principles, but where there might be a slight undercurrent of discomfort. And these are what I call edge cases um, of pulling in here a concept from ecology of edge effects. So in ecology, an edge is where two ecosystems meet. Um, such as at the edge of a pond or a lake. And edges typically are um, areas of high biodiversity um, and allow for uh, inter intermixing of species that can move between both environments. Um, and I think in, in an analogous way, edge cases can um, maybe uh, increase the diversity of our thinking about, um, about ethics and animals and research and um, hopefully provide an environment an environment an environment excuse me getting stuck on that word for innovation and growth so what counts as a harm uh, in relation to research with dogs and how much harm is too much harm the first case i want to mention um, is uh, research done by uh, Bon Bierda, a Dutch, re Dutch researcher in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, Bierda's research is really some of the foundational work that we have in understanding behavioral, physiological, and immun immunological stress responses in dogs to various aversive stimuli. Um, Bierda showed, for example, that social and spatial restriction being locked alone in a cage or crate uh, exposes dogs to chronic stress, and that socially and spatially restricted dogs exhibit a heightened state of aggression, excitement, and uncertainty. Bearda also identified a whole catalog of other stressors that link to behavioral, physiological, and immunolo immunological changes in dogs. Um, these include electric shock, harsh training methods, physical punishment, um, and sustained loud noise. The difficulty of Bearda's work is figuring out what, ca that what causes stress in dogs um, has involved deliberately exposing dogs to stressors. So for example, Bearda's work on social and spatial restriction involved keeping beagle puppies locked in a small cage alone for six weeks with no social interaction with humans or other dogs um, and barely enough space to turn around. His findings on acoustic stress likewise involved exposing laboratory beagles to blasts of loud noises at varying frequencies and at, um, to other intense acoustic stimuli. He wrote of his research, in his research, motivated by this lack of detailed data on behavioral responses in dogs subjected to experimental stressors, we investigated the behavior of six beagle dogs before, during, and after acoustic stress. Noise was chosen as the experimental stressor as it elicited profound responses in dogs that had been subjected to short-lasting sound blasts in a study that compared different stressors. Noise was presented at a frequency where dogs are sensitive to, acoust to acoustic stimuli and intensities were chosen below the levels that might induce possible hearing loss. Acoustic stressors were administered intermittently and randomly to minimize the time of noise exposure and to prevent ha fast habituation to of the stress responses. Finally, the experimental design was chosen to enable the investigation of a possible dose response relationship. One of the pieces gleaned, um, pieces of information gleaned from Bearda's work is that stress in dogs has identifiable behavioral correlates. For example, dogs who are socially isolated may also increasingly vocalize as their stress increases. Harsh training methods induce dogs to lower their standing posture, to sit in a more crouched position, 
to perform snout licking and to exhibit paw lifting. Knowing that crouched posture, vocalization, and mouth licking are all behavioral correlates of stress provides value, valuable information for dog behaviorists and trainers and veterinarians and for human guardians of companion dogs. So based on Beerda's research, we have a good base now to continue to identify sources of stress in dogs within the home environment, a place that turns out to be surprisingly stressful for companion dogs. Um, for example, Beerda's research on social and spatial restriction may help shape veterinary thinking about the appropriate use of crates for pet dogs. But Beerda's work also raises ethical questions about harm. Is it okay to deliberately expose dogs to unnatural stressors in order to understand what stresses them out? Consider another study designed to increase our understanding of sources of stress for home dogs. In this case, to add nuance to Beardus findings that linked stress with mouth licking behavior. An experiment designed by Nicola Albuquerque and colleagues inv involved exposing dogs to a stressor that elicits the mouth licking response. Dogs were presented, um, companion dogs, were presented with a pair of grayscale face images of familiar or unfamiliar humans or dogs with either positive or happy, playful or negative, angry, aggressive facial expressions. The images were paired with a sound from the same individual, again, positive or negative vocalization or a neutral sound. The research on mouth licking seems to directly benefit dogs kept as pets um, because the more accurately we can infer dog emotions from their behavior, the better we can use this information to improve canine welfare, presumably by protecting our dogs from experiences such as um, the stress caused by angry vocalizations from humans um, or angry faces. Depending on the individual and the context, um, however, aversive experiences, even short aversive experiences can have a long-term fallout. There seem to be two key differences between Albuquerque's research on mouth licking and earlier research by Beerda and others. Um, and question for consideration is, are these differences ethically significant? The experimental group in Albuquerque's mouth licking study was 17 companion dogs whose guardians had voluntarily enrolled them in the study, whereas the research cited by Beerda, the dogs were laboratory beagles. And I'll come back in a few minutes to the question of fair subject selection by just putting that out there now. And um, the second difference is that the harm imposed during Albuquerque's study was arguably fairly mild. A short term feeling of fear or discomfort on the part of the dogs, strong enough to elicit mouth licking behavior, but not so strongly aversive that their human guardians felt uncomfortable exposing their companion dogs to this experimental setup. So exploring another kind of harm here, um, trying to specify the principle of harm. Um, the Ainsworth Strange Situation Test is a procedure that was developed in the late 1960s by psychologist Mary Ainsworth to study and assess the attachment styles of young children to their parents, um, specifically secure versus insecure attachment styles. And Although it was broadly used by psychologists, the test did receive some criticism in relation to research on children because it exposed young children to distress, although the distress was temporary and was not thought to have any long-term adverse effects. Um, a modified version of the strange situation test has become a mainstay of canine cognition research um, and is used to study dog attachment styles um, to owners. As one example, uh, a study noted here in Frontiers of Behavioral Neuroscience looked at the physiological indicators of attachment in dogs using the strange situation test. Um, the experimental setup involved 29 dog owner dyads who had volunteered, that is to say the humans had volunteered. Um, the dogs were exposed to a separation from their owner 
a reuniting with their owner, and an exposure to a stranger. Before and after each of these interventions, the researchers took saliva samples, which they tested for cortisol and chromogranin A, both of, of which are used as physiological markers of stress. And incidentally, when discussing their results, the researchers acknowledged the process of coming to a novel environment, that is the university campus where the research was conducted, may actually have been more stressful for the dogs than the actual strain situation test. The harms in this case were minimal. They were temporary distress, but distress nevertheless, and dis distress that distinctly plays off the emotional attachment of dogs to their human guardians. Another push on the principle of harm or the question of what constitutes a harm is um, what's called um, the unsolvable or impossible task paradigm. And this is another mainstay of canine cognitive research. Um, the unsolvable task has been used to study dog-human communication, especially gazing behavior and contact seeking, as well as stress synchronization, and has been used to compare the communicative behavior of dogs to wolves, um, and pigs and etc. In this task, dogs learn how to solve a problem to obtain a reward. And after a fixed number of trials, the reward becomes impossible to access, leading to communicative attempts from the dog. So one question we might ask about the unsolvable task paradigm, as with the strange situation test, is whether imposing a brief period of stress on dogs is an ethically significant source of harm, and whether the harm, however minimal, is imposed for the sake of intellectual curiosity and knowledge acquisition, or whether it offers direct benefit to dogs, whether to dogs directly involved in the research or to companion dogs more generally, or dogs more generally. Like the strange situation test, the unsolvable task evokes an aversive emotional response, a state of physiological arousal. Of even more interest ethically, I think the unsolvable task and the strange situation task um, test rely as a key component of the study design on the close affiliative relationship between dogs and humans and between particular companion dogs and their human guardians. And this raises an interesting question about vulnerability. Does attachment to a human owner increase a canine research subject's vulnerability or does it decrease it? And how should we, how should we think about that? Should we look at companion dogs as uniquely protected in research because their companions and their guardians have volunteered them? Um, or are they uniquely vulnerable as, for example, compared to laboratory beagles? Does their relationship to us change the moral equation and in what ways? And what makes dogs in shelters or kennels uniquely vulnerable as opposed to pet dogs? I'm gonna present two cases here um, which push on the principle of justice or fairness. Um, one which seems to weigh burdens to dogs against benefits to humans, and one which, uh, in which one class or cast of dogs bears the burden for another. A 2008 study designed to test whether a synthetic analog of a pheromone called dog appeasing pheromone, which is released by mother dogs during the first few weeks after birth and has a calming effect, um, would similarly have a calming effect on puppies who have been taken from their canine mother and adopted by humans. In particular, the researchers wanted to know whether the DAP would help calm puppies during periods of social isolation. In their natural environment with a canine mother, puppies would almost never be socially isolated, and this experience is associated with high levels of stress. Dog owners, on the other hand, may find it necessary or convenient to impose periods of social isolation on puppies, such as when out, out of the house for work or play, or during the night if they've chosen to make the dog sleep separately. Puppies who are stressed can be annoying to their human owners. They might bark or whine or scratch, 
or chew things up or pee on the floor. So for the current study, puppies were selected at two phases. During the two to three weeks they spent at a pet shop, which was phase one, and during the first two weeks after adoption from the pet shop. All of the puppies in the study were fitted with a collar containing dog appeasing pheromone. Um, the dog appeasing pheromone um, treated puppies did in fact engage in somewhat fewer nuisance behaviors. It isn't clear whether the dog appeasing pheromone treatment actually reduced stress in the puppies, but the study did show that DAP collars can quickly and effectively reduce several of the stress-related nuisance behaviors of puppies in the days after adoption. So who benefits from this research? The information gleaned from this study seems primarily to benefit humans by reducing the nuisance level experienced by dog owners and to reinforce the practice of removing puppies from their mother prior to weaning so that we can have pets um, during their, particularly so that we can have dogs during the critical period of socialization of eight weeks. Um, pushing on fairness in a slightly different way here, um, what about subjecting some dogs to harm in order to benefit other dogs and specifically what about harming laboratory dogs to improve the well-being of companion dogs and this case is actually close to my heart because I hear this is my canine companion Bella um, who underwent a TPLO surgery for a torn cruciate ligament this is Bella shortly after surgery um, at the beginning of her um, I must say very painful um, convalescence so in one representative study of TPLO, um, 10 healthy beagles, beagles who had no ruptured tendons, were the study group. Five of these dogs underwent TPLO surgery, and five underwent a procedure called cranial tibial wedge osteotomy, a sort of competing, um, competing surgery. Um, before performing the surgery, on these 10 dogs, the left cranial cruciate ligament of each dog was surgically excised. The tibia was subluxated and the meniscus was released, approximating a cruciate ligament tear. The dogs underwent recovery for three months um, and were tested during that time for kinematic gait changes. Dogs who had the CTWO procedure were more likely to have significantly hyperextended gait patterns suggesting that TPLO may be a better choice, at least in this regard. And then um, finally, still trying to get the, the light beam off my face, um, I want to present a case uh, that pushes on the principle of respect for persons, um, and specifically the issue of consent and voluntariness. Um, over the last um, decade or so, several researchers, and notably here is Greg Burns, um, have been using awake neuroimaging, or fMRI, to investigate aspects of canine cognition. These fMRI studies have helped um, develop a better understanding of dogs' neural responses to an expected reward, um, excitement, um, which regions in the dog's brain are specialized for processing faces, human and canine, um, neural responses to human and dog odors, um, and the research has also shown that different regions of the brain are activated when a dog hears a human vocalization as opposed to a dog vocalization. Um, one example of fMRI research from 2018 um, explored the use of um, this awake neuroimaging to um, see what, uh, if we can gain better understanding of the mechanisms of how dogs discriminate uh, um, among different words and um, whether dogs, how dogs differentiate between um, real words um, that they and and what the researchers called pseudo words which the dogs have never heard before and this is just um, this is a picture of the research participants in this particular 2018 study 
So the question here is how do we judge the voluntariness of the dogs participating in this fMRI research? Um, if you've ever had an MRI, you know the experience is fairly aversive. Um, the same is true for dogs. So a dog has to remain absolutely still for an extended period of time in a somewhat claustrophobic confined space while being exposed to very loud noises um, and um, wearing headphones. Canine fMRI research tends to emphasize the voluntariness of participation by noting that dogs are not forced into the fMRI machine but are trained to tolerate the experience. Um, and here's a quote from this 2018 paper. Each dog had participated in a training program involving behavior shaping, desensitization, habituation, and behavior chaining to prepare for the loud noise and physical confines of the MRI bore inherent in fMRI studies. Training occurred over several months at the least and involved daily sessions at home and bi-weekly practices at a dog training facility. On the one hand, we might say, you know, this is great. The dogs were truly allowed to become comfortable with each stage of the process and consented piece by piece during the training. If dogs really weren't into it and couldn't learn to do it without, um, without objection, they were not enrolled in the study. Um, on the other hand, training is a way of manipulating dogs into doing what we want often based on control over food resources and the use of food as a reward. So does training a dog to do something like tolerate an fMRI machine really equal consent? Um, can a pet dog be said to volunteer for research given their dependence on us and their attachment to us? And I thought I would end with um, a case that seems to me really consistent with the Belmont principles and might provide a positive example of ethically robust animal research, and that is um, translational research on aging. Um, translational research on human and dog aging um, includes the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study, which um, is focused specifically on cancer and is following 3,000 golden um, canine subjects and the Dog Aging Project, which is broader in scope still and is tracking tens of thousands of dogs of diverse genetic backgrounds and is focused on biological and environmental determinants of aging. This seems like a win-win for the most part. Companion dogs share human environments and many have access to sophisticated healthcare, unlike dogs in kennels or shelters or laboratories. Um, a very large cohort of dogs is available to study, and there's wide variation in life expectancy and risks of mortality um, from certain diseases across dog breeds. Companion dogs are thought to be much more useful model for studying age aging than animals in the laboratory. Um, the domestic dog is, um, as I'm quoting from this paper that you see here, a genetically variable species living outside the lab in an environmentally variable world and a species that, like us, receives individualized care for diseases. Studies can be designed that pose minimal or no risk to dogs. And an example here is um, a study on canine cognitive dysfunction um, using biospecimens. Um, Sorry. Please go. Oh, it's not going to let me go back. Well, that's okay. Um, so, um, one really promising area of research is the study of Alzheimer's disease in conjunction with canine cognitive dysfunction. Laboratory models of Alzheimer's disease using mice, um, which have been very common, are limited because mice don't naturally develop. Alzheimer's disease-like pathology during aging. Um, laboratory beagles don't share human environments, so an also limited um, study model. Companion dogs, on the other hand, do share human environments and do develop age-associated Alzheimer's disease-like pathology and cognitive dysfunction. Um, studies 
can be designed that pose no risk of harm to dogs. Um, for example, one study um, that I can't go back to because it won't let me um, used biospecimens taken from donated brain tissue of deceased pet dogs. Um, amyloid beta levels were measured in three areas of the companion dog brain and correlations between higher amyloid levels and canine cognitive dysfunction were confirmed. Um, veterinary biobanking of donated brain tissue can provide specimens for further research in the future, again, without any um, harm being imposed on dogs. The research seems fair because it offers direct therapeutic benefits to dogs through better understanding of aging, the development of interventions to support healthy aging, increased public awareness of age-related illnesses in dogs and how to provide care. Also, dog, dog aging research may stimulate interest in veterinary gerontology um, um, and may eventually um, lead to the addition of this as uh, a list of clinical specialties, which would be great. Humans benefit from increased understanding of genetic and environmental determinants of aging and also from um, the study of aging within real life contexts and also from having our companions with us for as long as possible. So um, as I said, it seems like a win-win. I'm sure we could dig up some, um, some ethical uh, difficulties or complexities with this case, but um, I think it provides a really nice example of, um, of research that affirms the Belmont principles in relation to dogs um, and provides valuable information in a fair way. Um, and so hopefully um, as medical research transforms over time, um, dogs can become an increasingly important um, participant in in our research efforts as long as it is um, with their consent and fair and um, and causes no or very minimal harm. So um, thank you for listening. I'm going to close it up there and um, invite other other ideas about how to apply the Belmont principles to our our lives and um, scientific investigations of dogs and canine cognition. All right, thank you very much.